Welcome back to week five of the Investor's Guide to Thriving online edition, where we help you make sense of what's going on in the financial world. That's a tall order at the moment. <laughs> in theory, someone would have paid you $37 to take away a barrel of their oil earlier this week. It's the first time that we've seen an official bear market and a bull market during one series of our events. Yeah, the world's a strange place right now. So I'm glad I'm just doing the intro and we have Larry here to do the heavy lifting. Well, folks, our mission as always is to help you do better with your money so you can live your best possible life and sleep at night. Over the years, we've had the privilege of helping many investors protect and grow their wealth. Larry and I started ETF Capital Management together back in 2006 with just $10 million under management. Today, we manage close to $1.7 billion. As you know, we manage ETFs and funds of ETFs in partnership with BMO Global Asset Management. You can learn more about these at zzzportfolios.com and they're available to you at any financial institution. We also provide private wealth services to clients with investable assets of a million dollars and up. ETF Capital Management is in turn part of a larger organization called Quintessence Wealth. We created QWealth for independent portfolio managers like ourselves who want to bring their client experience into the 21st century. A big part of that is fixing the inefficiencies and vulnerabilities of today's financial markets to allow clients to sleep at night. But even more important than that is our focus on financial life strategy. This brings all the elements of your life and your finances together. Next week on April 28th, you'll have the opportunity to join a webinar with Monique Madden, our head of financial life strategy. In a presentation she calls, people plan while the universe laughs. Monique will discuss the top three things you can do to ensure that you and your family and your lifestyle are protected from events like this pandemic and anything else that life throws at you. You can register on upotential.com or by opting in on the survey you'll receive after tonight's webinar. That same survey is your gateway to catch a replay of tonight's webinar, past week's webinars, and also ask questions uh, from for um, the next event with Larry. Um, you'll also be able to download the slides from today's presentation as well. Once you complete the survey, you'll get access to the links for all of the above. And if you wanna catch Larry on BNN, folks, the show keeps jumping around. Uh, tomorrow is gonna to be 4.30 p.m., uh, Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, but because it does keep moving around, we're posting all of the segments on Larry's blog, which some of you may have visited before, bermanscall.com, it's easy to remember. And that's where you can go to find all of the links to past shows. Now, Investor's Guide to Thriving comes to you at no cost. We do this because uh, Larry and I believe passionately in supporting the causes at Sick Kids and Baycrest Foundations. So we hope that you can join Larry and I in supporting childhood leukemia research at Sick Kids and the groundbreaking work being done at the Baycrest Foundation into the treatment of Alzheimer's and dementia. Larry and I match all of your donations. So for those of you who would like to make donations, please use the links in the survey you'll receive after the event. For those of you who have made donations, thank you so much. Thanks also to our sponsors, National Bank Direct Brokerage and BMO ETFs. BMO ETFs has been our partner in ETF education for over 10 years, and not many people do it better than our good friend, Mr. Rob Butler from BMO ETFs. Thanks, Jared. I just saw a picture there, not to confuse me with uh, my boss, but uh, Kevin and I do a lot of work with Larry and the group across the country. Usually we're in there uh, in person, uh, using movie theaters for the last couple of years. So this will be one of the, the first times doing the webinar function or format. So hopefully it goes very well. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us here today. We're going to talk a little bit about our covered call lineup. Now these are strategies that have been in the market for uh, almost 10 years now. ZWB was the first income strategy that we had launched really in the early days of BMO ETFs when they were launching ETFs into the Canadian marketplace for the first time. Now that product line has been expanded materially, uh, but I think what's important is to understand that the mechanics behind any one of them is identical. So meaning it's not abstract in the way that we're delivering that consistent income for our client base. The products do exactly what they're, they're, what they're supposed to do, and that's why they're so widely held and used in the Canadian client business of investing. What we do look at, we look at quality dividend payers. So when we use an ETF or you're structuring an ETF, we want to make sure that the securities underneath have a consistent dividend stream tied to them. 
we tend to use securities that produce a lower volatility behavior so they don't effectively move around as much in dramatic markets and i think the last five weeks are a great example of why we would want to avoid high volatility names which we will get into in a few minutes here uh, we do want to attract a high enough yield but we don't want to stretch for yield at the expense of a quality name so it's really a balancing act between finding that quality dividend payer but also finding a dividend payer that has an attractive consistent yield tied to it everything i'm going to talk about is going to be delivering a tax efficient yield or cash flow everything we do with the covered call side they do pay monthly coupons and we have a lot of clients that are moving into their retirement years and it's really important for them to be able to match their liability with their cash flow and the fixed income market being what it is today and very difficult to earn a high enough yield on a bond portfolio or a traditional GIC the need and the appropriateness for a covered call product is that much more relevant lastly low cost across anything we do and that's where the advent of ETFs came from it was trying to produce a low cost product for clients that were very uh, adaptable and really appropriate for many different investors so when they do this house diagram here the way I understand it and what I like to describe to my clients when they're using a covered call product is this think about that rental property that you may actually have or you've entertained the idea of buying a house and then renting it out to somebody think about investing in a covered call product in a similar fashion in that you're investing the money so the money in whatever the underlying ETF is is equivalent to buying the house and the cash flow that you're receiving on a monthly basis is similar to a rental fee or the cash flow that you'd be earning from a, a rental property itself that's the way I think about it and I think without trying to get too granular uh, within what a covered call is that's a great way to think about it it's a way to generate cash flow with a very conservative asset class and that's what we're doing here today uh, some of the things that we think about, and, and I think it's it's very important to understand where the money is coming from when you buy a covered call product in the form of an ETF. One is that, and some of the things that we're thinking about when we are structuring these investments, we don't want to buy any one name that's particularly volatile. And what I mean by that, we don't want to see large up movements, nor do we want to see material down movements. So we're going to buy securities that are a little bit more conservative and behave better in, in times of volatile markets like we've actually experienced in the last four or five weeks here. The second part of that is we want to write options on securities, again, uh, spreading the risk over one month and two months. So anyone that's well-versed in the options market or they look at derivatives themselves, that's how we structure all of our covered call products. We're writing 60% of the uh, 30 day options and then the remainder or the remaining third will be on a two month or a 60 day option expiry. The other part is we only write on half the portfolio and we've got a couple slides to kind of highlight why that's relevant and why you need to be aware of it. So you take that function and then you combine it with the dividend itself. So when I talk to you about what the underlying portfolio holds, the combination of the dividend itself plus the option strategy or the covered call strategy we use combined is where the total cash flow is coming from. So the one thing it's good to be aware of is that when a portfolio is, is considering themselves a covered call product, when they write on the entire portfolio, and that means writing options across all of the assets under management and all of the names that are held within that particular investment, what ends up happening is you, you, you're giving up too much of the upside and when markets are in recovery mode or strong growth mode you want to be careful that you're not giving up a hundred percent of the upside performance because what that means is every time the market moves up in in a strong direction or a positive direction you're going to be called away essentially and what happens is that you don't get to participate in the appreciation of the price value of the etf and on the next page what you'll see is that we take a different approach to that. What we do is we only write on half the assets under management. So the idea there, to contrast it with the previous slide, is at all times, half of the assets that are being managed in a covered call product are effectively long the market. And all that means is, if, as the market's going up, 
on half the portfolio, you're going to you're going to participate 100% in any upside growth. And in return, we do generate income or some additional yield with the covered call strategy, but it's not at the expense of seeing growth in the portfolio. It's a nice combination of of, of the two. So when you're looking at any covered call product, whether it's ours or a competitor's, you do want to get a better sense for what percentage of the, the product is being written on or what percentage of the securities. And that'll give you some indication of how growthy uh, or what the growth potential might be within that particular investment. Next slide there, Larry. Oh, so this is a great breakdown. So I mentioned this earlier. This is listing in the case of ZWC on the far left. That is a Canadian dividend product with a covered call overlay. And what we've highlighted here for you is the dividend yield and the weight itself. So you'll see in the case of Canada, BCE, Enbridge, TransCanada, 5.3%, 5.07, 5.04. That's what percentage of the portfolio each of these securities is making up or representative of. And what you'll find in the case of ZWG, which is to its immediate right, it's the same product. The only difference is it's got a global focus to it. So all of a sudden, you're going to see high quality names with a slight dividend focus to them, such as Microsoft, Total, uh, Verizon, Johnson & Johnson. Many of these you're familiar with, with your, I mean, Johnson & Johnson, I think is a great example with some of the products that you have in your house. It's a great way to invest outside of the Canadian market and be able to buy names that maybe you wouldn't want to do on your own, but you're familiar with and you're comfortable with. You'll notice that at the top, in the case of Canada, that particular product right now has a yield of 9.01%. And on the far right, in the case of ZWG being a global product, it has a current yield of 7.11. I mean, these are very significant uh, cash flow tools currently because there is volatility in the market. And you're likely hearing that when you're watching uh, BNN in the evenings or in the mornings. They're talking about how much volatility is in the marketplace. The unique part of a covered call is you can actually harness or, or benefit from that volatility in the options market, and then in return, you're getting a higher cash flow. And at the bottom of each of those charts, that's the dividend yield itself. So interestingly, if you were to buy BCE by itself, the dividend yield at the current time of the slide creation was 5.88%. So what you're seeing is that you can buy the ETF, which has BCE within the basket, and then you apply the covered call piece to enhance the overall yield to 9%. Next slide, please. So the impacts of a covered call. And everyone might say, wow, 9%, that sounds fantastic. What am I giving up re in return? What's the catch? And I think that's a fair question to ask if you're not familiar with what the options market uh, delivers to an investment. So looking at down markets, the product or the price movement of the product will reflect how the underlying securities are trading in the market. So that BECE example, if you were to look at a BCE and how it's behaved in the last four weeks, you should assume that the actual investment or the ETF itself price movement will look very similar to what the underlying securities and how they're behaving in the secondary market. The difference is the additional income that you're generating each month is the difference between how the investment itself is doing and what the additional income that it's generating for you. So I wouldn't suggest that a, a covered call product is less risk necessarily, but what it does offer is some protection in the form of additional cash flow or additional yield hitting your cash account every month as far as its total return. Now, in the case of a rising market, what you're going to be giving up there is some of the upside participation. So when we talked a minute ago about 50% of the basket of securities uh, being written on, but you're still long only on half the basket, that's where the limitation comes in. If it's a strong trajectory to the upside and strong recovery, you will be giving up a little bit of the upside return in return for that consistent cash flow. So when I have clients that look at a covered call product, by no means do I tell them that this particular tool is better in and of itself than buying a basket of the same dividend names by themselves. What I would say that is if you're genuinely after enhanced yield, tax efficient cash flow, then the covered call product can make a ton of sense uh, to a portfolio and be a nice complement to what you're doing. 
the last piece there is sideways markets. Sideways markets, and that just means that the, let's assume it's the S&P 500 that we're using as a reference. If it's trading up and down a couple percent, normal behavior, not, not again in the last couple of weeks, obviously, but prior to that, it chugs along up and down 2%. Covered calls should look pretty darn good. As long as the market's not rising at a rapid tilt, the covered call product would tend to keep up or at least track very closely to the long only equivalent of that. Next slide, please. So here is a list of everything we're doing in the covered call space. And we do populate this or, or uh, per, sorry, publish this to our website, uh, B, BMO, ETFS.ca. We have a section for derivatives and the derivative makeup of what the products look like in the current environment. And what I mean by that, you can just follow along here at the top of the page, ZWB. At the moment, we're actually only writing on 39.62% of the portfolio. So just over a third of the portfolio is being written on, which then means, based on what we just talked about, almost 60% of the portfolio is long only. Out of the moneyness, so that's how far out of the money we're writing the options. And on average, in the case of ZWB, which is the Canadian banks, it's around 12 and 12.5%. The other part that I think clients often want to get a better sense of is scrolling across to the right of the page under dividend yield. Let's assume we didn't do a covered call overlay on any of these products. The dividend yield is what that basket would have been yielding without the covered call piece attached. And as such, you can go just to the left of it under annualized option yield. The combination of the dividend yield plus the annualized option yield is what that particular ETF is yielding currently. Now, granted, it is variable. The dividends are pretty consistent, unless the particular security cuts their dividend. It's the option yield that will vary. But in, again, this current market with higher volatility recently, it's a very effective way to capture and crystallize volatility and enhance your total income to your portfolios. So I think it's a great tool to look at. And when you look right below that, all we've done there is we've listed everything we offer in the covered call universe. You'll see the headings such as the Dow Jones, we have the Canadian banks, the US banks. The new one, and we, we touched upon it a minute ago, was ZWG, which is the global high dividend covered call. Interesting there, anyone that's followed the ESG uh, research and headlines where clients are becoming more savvy when it comes to environmental uh, governance and social aspects of running businesses, ZWG is also ESG uh, compliant. So clients that are paying attention to those characteristics of an investment, this is a very compelling way to buy a global product with a very high income of over 7% right now, and you know you're buying the highest quality ESG names based on uh, MSCI's particular screening process. So of all the products there, that would be the one that, that would highlight there. So that's really it for me. I want to spend 10 minutes on reviewing what it is we do in the covered call space. Again, it's a very compelling asset class in the event that you're looking for a tool to enhance your income or overall income without taking on unwarranted risk in any uh, exotic type of product. Everything available on bmoetfs.ca. And Rob Butler is my name. If you've seen anything you like and you want to maybe hash some ideas around, just send me a note or an email and I'll try to assist in that way. And you'll see that website there. So I'm going to transition to why we're all here, and that's to Larry Berman. Larry and I do a lot of work, as I mentioned, from the onset. Typically, we're on the road together filling movie theaters, and obviously, it's him that's the big draw, but we always like to uh, share different ideas around the ETF space, as well as the tactical asset management that he brings to the marketplace in Canada. I think it's interesting in that he's got a great perspective on what's going on in the marketplace and no time other than right now do we have clients and reverse inquiry around getting insight into what we're seeing, what Larry's seeing, what his outlook is into the marketplace. So I'm excited to have him here tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. And Larry, I'll hand the stage over to you. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that, Rob. And, uh, you know, sad that I won't be able to join you out in uh, Calgary this year at the Stampede. Uh, Rob is the uh, ETF expert for uh, Western Canada and Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Anyways, 
Western Gaec, excluding BC. So thanks again for that, Rob. Uh, great, great uh, insight into covered call strategies. One of the questions that just came in uh, before I started talking, uh, Dave asked about, you know, is it better to buy ZWB or ZEB? And one of the things that Rob mentioned was that when you when you get into uh, a higher volatile market, you get more premium coming out of the uh, volatility aspect as opposed to the dividend aspect of, of these holdings. But if you're going into a strong up market, you're going to give away some upside, as Rob also highlighted. So, you know, with everything, when you choose, you've got to make a market call. And if you're really bullish on the outlook, then you want to own a ZEB. Um, and if you think it's going to go sideways or slightly lower, then a ZWB is better. But if we get a violent correction to the downside like we did, that extra premium that you would earn over a year uh, in the option strategy doesn't protect you a whole lot when the market falls 30% in a couple of weeks. So those are a couple of the things uh, to keep in mind. So on to my presentation here. Uh, for those of you who have been us, with us for all five weeks, thank you so much for for joining us and, and continuing. As always, every week I try to put in a couple new ideas and new slides and, and try to navigate you guys through this uh, very, very difficult market environment that in my uh, educated and, and humble opinion, because the market is ultimately the market and the best teacher, uh, we're in the very, very early innings of. Uh, so the, this unprecedented amount of, of government largesse and support, um, I'm going to cover that, uh, talk about all the debt um, and, and the monetization in particular. I'm going to talk about what's gone on in the crude oil uh, uh, markets and, and what we can do about those in terms of investing, uh, and then look at some alternatives to hedge or not to hedge, uh, assessing the current fear and greed in the market, and then talk about my shopping list and, and answer a bunch of uh, questions um, that we can hopefully get to as many as possible. So, you know, here's a question. So the unlimited QE, the unlimited support from the central banks, from the governments, trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars they're spending, pros and cons. So, so on the pro side, and the list can be bigger than this for sure, uh, you've got uh, liquidity, um, and then you, you've got the fact that it's unlimited. And over the last decade and coming out of the last crisis, the idea that it was liquidity plentiful and more money's going around. And, and so investment markets went up. And so that's OK, except the look what the balance sheets of the four big centers. This doesn't include the Bank of China, which is also a massive um, uh, fiscal stimulus, if you will. So the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, those giant four central banks make up massive amount of, of the global economy, you know, where by way Bank of Canada now is doing QE also. Um, but those combined make up about 85% of, of the central banks in the world. Um, and and now the their size of their balance sheets as a percentage of GDP is 40%. By the end of this year, I estimate it's going to be closer to 60%. And within the next five years, and maybe sooner, it's going to be 100%. The central banks of the world are going to have to monetize um, almost all of this new debt coming in because we can't afford it. Now, some of, when I, at the end of the seminar, when I talk about some of the potential outcomes, one of them is is a, is a move politically to to the left, um, higher taxes, um, kind of not unlike what we saw during the 1930s. The the highest marginal tax rate um, was was in the 90th 90 percent plus. I think it was 94 percent at the high high rate um, going into World War II, um, and and we're going back to those that those kind of numbers because. The central banks won't be able to monetize it all. And at some point it becomes very inflationary, but the most immediate impact of all this largesse is going to be an era of stagflation, which is very, very sluggish economic growth for, for all this debt and, and demographic reasons. 
um, and ultimately cause inflation because there's there's going to be hits to supply, less globalization and so forth. So a lot of the con side is, is a debasement of fiat currency. Uh, back in 1972, the world was on the gold standard and ever since then, gold has less meaning. But really this, this large S that has come in um, is, is really spearheaded gold. Some of you may have uh, caught the forecast from Bank of America uh, earlier this week that they think gold within 18 months will be $3,000. I don't know how anybody can possibly come up with a number on what it might or might not be, but the answer's higher. And a lot of questions come in on gold. Guys, when gold was $1,100 a couple of years ago, uh, I said on a risk-adjusted basis on one of my educational episodes that it was the cheapest asset class on the planet that I was most bullish about for the next number of years. Because ultimately, I, I didn't think of COVID-19, whatever. I had no idea what the catalyst would be to break the back of all this monumental debt we have in the world. But make no mistake, trying to fix this problem by adding even more debt is not the solution. And so when it comes to, you know, is this bullish or bearish and how I look at the world, th this is uh, most the most bearish. The fact that they have to spend all this money and, 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 and zero and negative interest rates just to keep the economy ticking is staggeringly bearish in my view of the world. And I think it's coming whether we like it or not doesn't mean equity markets won't rally here, guys. And I've got some charts on that too. But to me, there's there, there's a lack of confidence. There's there's potential for inflation, and inflation, uh, the debasement of fiat currencies, and and when they try to unwind the balance sheet starting in early 2017 into early 2018, the equity markets had a stroke literally in the fourth quarter of 2018, and the Fed had to reverse track. They can't get out of this. This is a liquidity trap of major proportions, and it's just demonstrably bullish for gold and gold equities. Um, so you are you gotta be a dip buyer. And uh, I, I, there's no other way to, to say it. But, but for the last, five, six years, everyone's been calling me a bear, Larry Berman, you should change your name to bear man, you're, you're so negative. And th this is the chart that I put up for the last five weeks, every week. Um, and it's because the money coming in to the US Treasury for corporate taxes has not gone up since the end of 2012. And this is a big, big problem. And when we look at the size of the debt on corporate balance sheets, you know, a, a lot of the, the use of that debt, you know, when, when, when you get, when you have earnings, you know, you have earnings that come in, uh, what do you do with them? Um, and is, is a, an officer uh, of a corporation. So I've criticized buybacks and, and some questions came in on that. And I'm extremely bearish on buybacks because look at the facts here, folks. Look at the net buybacks, um, IBM as an example. So IBM has a current market cap of around $130 billion. Okay, listen very closely, guys. Over the last decade, in share buybacks, IBM has bought, you ready, ready for this? $140 billion of their own stock. And if you don't think that's egregious, I think you're, I know Warren Buffett says it's a good way to give money back. I, I disagree because the one of the reasons we're, we're stagnating in terms of growth, when a corporation has a profit, Okay, so part can be paid back as a dividend. I'm good with that. Obviously, we can do share buybacks, um, but we can also invest in R&D and plant and equipment. And corporate investment in R&D and plant and equipment, and I, in other words, productive capital has been non-existent. And when you look at what's driven the markets higher, for the last eight years where there has been no 
real corporate profits and you look at it and it's all share buybacks. And anybody who's put their hat in the hand like the airline industry, who's been the worst, worst culprit and now needs government bailouts, not, not because they were at fault for this, of course they weren't, but they were not good corporate stewards. And I believe share buybacks are going to become part of the ESG factor when we talk about corporate governance. And the companies that don't have good balance sheets and are not good corporate stewards and are leveraging up to buy back their own shares, largely to enrich the executives, are going to be punished by the market. And we can see this in the difference of returns between the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 share buyback index. If you don't believe this is real, we have a different view of the world. This is going to be a major, major issue in the coming years. And I think it's important that people really understand that. So I wanna talk about the crude realities of the world. This shock of, 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 of demand shock of the world, uh, at the same time, Russia chooses to pick a fight with OPEC. March 6th is a Friday. There were rumors and rumblings that Russia and, and OPEC weren't happy. And we saw oil prices on the front month fall into the low 40s. That was my downside target, technically. I've been saying for years on BNN, $50 plus or minus 10 is my trading range. You can look at the futures contracts going out a decade. That's where the prices were. And even today, look at that, look at that green line where it was a month ago. Okay, so that green line there is March 6th futures curve for West Texas Intermediate. And we got into the low 40s on the front month. So on the left side of the charts, those are the shorter term contracts, but the back months were trading at 50. And so we had some supply considerations, but they weren't supply, they were demand because of, of, of COVID. But when the producers weren't going to cut enough supply to meet the shrinkage in demand, we had a major, major issue on, on hand. Now, I get a lot of questions um, from people, how do I play this? And my answer to everybody is don't try. Because the if you don't understand contango and backwardation and how forward markets work, you don't stand a chance. And I'm telling you right now, guys, I've been a commodity registered commodity trading advisor since 1995, and I've been trading commodity futures and options for 25 years. And this move, guys, blew me away. Okay, so what's gone on now? We, we've got this incredible shock, and the supply side hasn't adjusted, and we're going to continue to see pressure on the front month contracts. And a couple ETFs have blown up. USO has completely restructured how they do things. They're now not buying, no longer buying the first month. They're spreading it out and so forth. It's, it's a sh shit show, if I can say that. Um, so if you look at where the, the curve was, you know, a week ago, a month ago, and where it is today, you see extreme, extreme pressure on, on the short-term contracts. And that's gonna be with us for a while. But what it's doing is, it, what, what I believe Russia wants, and, and to some extent, a lot of the other OPEC members, is to completely crush the US fracking industry. And I don't believe they're gonna let up in any major way. And the deal that they signed that Trump said was wonderful, was crappy, is not there it's there's going to be no relief and the only relief folks is a vaccine and getting everybody back to work and getting the economy back at, at, at capacity but even when it comes back it's coming back at 50 percent and uh, three months later it'll be 60 percent and and three years from now i'd be shocked if we were at 90 percent capacity compared to what we were just only a few months ago. So we're, we're not gonna recover. This is not gonna be a V bottom, no chance. I will bet anybody any amount of money on it with a 95% confidence. And what that means is there's a chance I'm wrong. 
maybe it is a V bottom, but I wouldn't make that bet. Everything I see in the world today tells me if I make that bet, it's the wrong bet. It could happen, but it's an extremely low probability. So when I talked about um, in the past, uh, the 2008 and nine playbook, I'm referring to the extreme level of volatility and, and, you, and trying to understand what, what VIX is telling us. And as long as VIX stays relatively about above 40, which it has, we've seen it dip below there. That 40 is not a buy and sell trigger at all. Don't, don't think of it that way. Um, when VIX is at 40, the, to, to understand what that means, it's a 2.5% daily trading range. A VIX at 80, folks, is a 5% trading range. A VIX at 10 is a 0 0.63 trading range. Daily, weekly 1.4%. VIX of 80, 5% daily, 11% weekly. To calculate based on the current VIX, you take the number of VIX, you divide it by the square root of the number of trading days in a year, 252. If you want a weekly number, you divide it by the number of weeks in a year. So the bottom's not in until we see a prolonged period, at least a week, but, but probably longer, and VIX start to really drop below 40. And we're just not there yet. And I think there's at least months and months and months of this to come. Folks, this is the longest, this is, sorry, not the longest. This is the most acute shock to the global economy that the world has ever seen. And to think it's over in a V is absolutely insane to me. But a lot of people are of that opinion. I think a lot of people who are of that opinion are of that opinion because they are long only investors. Okay, and being long only investor, you almost always have to tell a bullish story because that's what you sell. And I just don't think it's it's the right way to, to think about things. So I encourage people in terms of answering the question when is to understand what this fear and greed index is to really understand. So this is not a measurement of investor sentiment i.e., are you bullish or bearish, Larry? I'm bullish. How about you, John? How about you, Fred? How about you, Marsha? And so forth. And then say, are you bullish or bearish and how invested you are? That's the AAII. That's the institutional investor. How much? These are market measurement metrics. There are seven factors. So it looks at volatility and how extreme it is relative to its own 50-day average. It looks at put call ratios. So what investors and speculators are doing in the options market where they can get leverage or seek to protect their portfolios. It looks at market breadth in terms of the uh, McClellan volume summation index. And that's a measurement of basically how many stocks are going up versus going down. So market breadth is important. The diffusion index between the return on stocks and bonds. How many new stocks are making new highs relative to new lows on a yearly basis? The spread between high quality corporate bonds and crappy junk bonds. And then the difference, I see how far we have we deviated from the six month average, 252 trading days in a year, 125 in a six month period. So I'm working on an index like this and it's a, it's a labor of love ongoing project, but I will have something like this on our website, on the Berman's Call website, and people will be able to go see it. And it'll be much more in detail than this. But effectively, what I want people to understand and do and learn from this environment is that when we are in an environment of extreme greed, that you get defensive in your portfolio. You do something to mitigate the potential risk. What we don't know and will never know is when it'll happen. But when these things are extreme one way or the other, there's opportunity, okay? So you must, must, must get more defensive when there's maximum greed, and you must, must, must get more aggressive when there's maximum fear. That's, it's very simple. So I encourage you to use this until mine's ready, and then you can, you can have a look at mine, because I, I, this is a very simple tool for do-it-yourselfers. Now, where are we now? We're, we're kind of in the middle. So what do you do here? When you're in the middle and you're not clear and there's no real big evidence, you, you step back and you look at the big picture. 
and you answer the question that I just asked. This is the biggest economic shock in history. Is this likely to be a V bottom or is this likely to persist for an extended period of time? Which is very, very different than the dip we saw in late 2018 when the yield curve hasn't inverted. And the PE was actually pretty good. The PE today is crap, it's expensive. In fact, on a forward earnings basis, the market is more expensive today than it was in January, okay? So you have to understand how to measure markets and then you can make better decisions. It, it's, it's really essential from that perspective. You know, so ultimately, Gilead, where is, where's the bottom, Larry? It, it's fundamental, it's earnings. And this market is not going to bottom until earnings get closer to a trough. And folks, we're not even close. So the in the average recession, earnings fall about 15%. And from where they've marked them down so far, we're not there. In the average recession, equities fall 29%. And we've seen that at the recent low, we fell a little over 30% on the S&P. But what I would submit to you is that in the Papa Bears, when the PE is high to start with, those corrections are a lot closer to the 40 to 50% range. So not until we're at 40 to 50% lower, to me, we'll, we'll, should we be looking for a big bottom? Okay, that, and that's just my view of the world, and a lot of people will disagree for lots of different reasons. But it's gonna take two to four years at a minimum for earnings to recover, okay? So, so let's have a look at, with the, at what these geniuses on Wall Street uh, are thinking about earnings here, okay? So what are the geniuses on Wall Street thinking about earnings? Well, they just started marking down this year, 2020. And so out to the end of this year, so the earnings in the bank, 151.44, that's trailing earnings. The, now they expect earnings to decline. Looks like, what is that, a little less than 10%, about 8%. Okay, it's got to be 15 minimum. But next year, so for 2021, so all the analysts have done today is take that money out of 2020 and put it into 2021. 20. They think that 2022 earnings for the S&P 500 in the worst economic hit to the world since the Great Depression is going to be up 25% from here. To those analysts, I say you guys are unbelievably, ridiculously, uh, unmitigatedly wrong. So where do we bottom? Because 30% of the earnings per share folks aren't real. 10% of them were share buybacks. 10% of them is non-GAAP pro forma BS earnings. And 10% was the Trump tax cut, which if Trump loses, uh, and I'll talk more about that in future uh, presentations as, as we get closer to the election for sure, um, the Dems will reverse and taxes will be going up in a huge way. The growth in the market in 2017, guys, was all gains from the US dollar weakening because 50% of those earnings come from foreign sources and when the US dollar is weak, earnings go up, but it's not real, it's just currency adjustment. So what's going on under the hood? So what we're looking at here on the right top graphic is the value line geometric average. And you can go Google search what that is, but it's basically, what is the change in the average price of the average stock? So it equally weights everything. And I'm going back here to 2000. And we can see that the average stock going back to 2000 has done nothing, okay? The lines at the bottom are the percentage of stocks above their 200 day averages. Now, we had a trading buy, there's no doubt in my mind, near the recent lows. And for me, I covered all my hedges, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the top 20 stocks in the VTI, so what's the VTI? The VTI is the Vanguard Total U.S. Index. It's every stock in the U.S. 
So currently 3,556 names in that ETF. Here's the list of the top 20. If you look at the list, looks like the Dow actually, doesn't it? It's just about got about every every name in the Dow. Google's not in the Dow. Uh, Berkshire's not in the Dow, but it's got about just about every name in the Dow. The weight of the top 20 stocks in the US, 30% of the entire US market. And when you look at what those stocks have done, up, 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 up for years. So the largest stocks are carrying the entire world index. And if you're picking stocks, guys, and you're not in these big names, your portfolios are flat for the last 20 years. These 20 stocks are 15% of the entire world index. The 30% of the Russell 2000, so the bottom 2000-ish stocks of VTI, 30% of them don't make any money and haven't for years. And that, as Donald Trump says, was in the best economy ever. If 30% of companies can't make money with zero interest rates, wow. So, so question to you folks, is this the best economy ever? Royal Bank, okay, the biggest stock in the TSX, it's 6.1% of the TSX. If that was a US stock in, uh, in the VTI, it would be the 62nd largest stock. It's the 85th largest stock in the world, but it's the biggest in Canada. So perspective, Canada is about 3% of the world index. You've got to start looking out beyond Canada. Canada has very little healthcare, very little technology, almost no technology of the future, maybe with the exception of Shopify, which is now I think the third or fourth largest stock in Canada, which is off the reservation expensive but it's, it's a momentum play and people are buying today what's working. But the average stock, folks, is not done well for 20 years. And if you don't get that and you don't understand that this is not a strong economy and this shock is not going to improve that, you, 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 you got to have, I think, you got to think about that. But you got to understand about indexes too and what indexes mean. So... The reason I'm, I'm more negative than positive is because I, I think the world's very fragile here. And at least for the last decade, one of the reasons it's, it's done well um, is because of free money and, and a lot of largesse from governments. But we're at a point now where debt to GDP globally is staggering. And those numbers are only gonna get worse monetized by the central bank. So if you think that's a quality economy, we, we, we have a different view of the world. So a little bit on sleep at night and what we do in our portfolio. So ZZZD. So I talked about uh, and compared to the world index. Now ZZZD, the daily standard deviation. So the translation of the VIX, remember a VIX of 10 is 0 0.63. So I run the sleep at night dividend portfolio with a standard deviation of less than VIX 10. The benchmark of the world, has a daily standard deviation of 0 0.83. So we're running, trying to generate good dividends, good yield with less volatility equals more sleep at night. It's, it's very, very simple. Now, some people have criticized, oh, Larry, your, your, your portfolio went down. Yeah, and it owns stocks. And in fact, dividend stocks went down way more than did technology stocks. The NASDAQ, as of a couple of days ago, was up on the year, the QQQs. Like, go figure. So money's going into these large names that are working. The bottom will come when people start throwing out those large names and selling them, and not until, okay? So the three funds that I run for BMO, ZZZD is the Global Tactical Dividend Fund. And in, in the mutual fund world, the Bloomberg symbol for that is B-M-O-T-D-E-T-F, okay? The benchmark is the iShare Global Monthly Dividend Index. So you can go buy for about the same MER, the iShare Global Monthly Dividend. So that's it's what I'm trying to do. 
it's fine global, see global dividends of good quality companies, and uh, but that's passive. It's a passive index. And that index from peak to trough there, as you can see, fell about 40%, where the ZZZ, the BMO Tactical Dividend Fund, fell half. And now it's currently down 10, and CYH is currently down 20, what is it, 25, 69. So, so you know, we're down 9.15, the benchmark. That's sleep at night, folks. It doesn't eliminate the downside. One of the new tools that I have that I didn't have weeks ago is now the ability to use puts uh, in the portfolio for additional downside protection. So in these three funds, I've got more potential to protect and grow the downside. And I'll talk about how I, I do those in the portfolios. But for the, the average person who's just, look at the CNN Fear and Greed Index. And when the CNN Fear and Greed Index is, is at greed, buy ZCON, buy 40% global equities and 60% global bonds and have more fixed income in your portfolio. And when you're neutral, go to the traditional balanced and have 60-40. And when it's oversold and weak, buy the growth portfolio. For some of you, maybe the full world, 100% equities, whatever's right for you. And your portfolios can be that simple. They really can be, but you gotta, you gotta be able to move them around. Okay, so you need the tools for that. And, and that's what I, you know, I've often tried to do every, every week on, on Berman's call and, and educating people and, and doing webinars uh, like this. So. Where's the bottom gonna be? The answer is, I don't know. It might be in already. The lows we saw in March might be the lows. Last week, Goldman Sachs, who the week before said we were going lower, changed their mind and said, nope, the bottom is in. So who do you believe? Folks, the answer is nobody knows and don't believe anybody. Have a plan not only a financial plan, so you understand what your retirement future should look like, which will help you define how much risk you should be taking to meet those goals. Because folks, it's not about what stock to pick, it really isn't. It's about having a plan. And when you have a plan and you're confident in executing that plan, that is sleep at night. Okay, that's what we do for our clients. We figure out what their needs are. We, we help them reach that end goal with less anxiety. Uh, because in periods like this, there's lots of questions. There's lots of anxiety. So where's the bottom? I don't know. But technically, if we look at some of the targets, okay, for me, if 120, they talk about the, all the, the bulls come on TV and talk about a normalized earnings number. For me, what I think that normalized earnings number should be based on 120 S&P. And that wipes out the 30% of bogus numbers that I don't believe should be there. And I don't think the multiple should be 20 like it is today. We saw a few, few slides ago. I believe the multiple should be 16. That gives us an S&P 1920. So technically the 50% retracement is 2030. Are we gonna get there? I don't know. But if we do, what do we do about it? What if it's the 61.8% retracement, which would be much closer to 50% from the high? You can see the high there, 339, 352. 1708, about 50%. So that could be a target. It could be the highs from 2000 and 2007, which was a 1550, 1575. Those could be where the support is. Nobody knows. And it could be worse. And I don't know. So. As the market goes up and down, like it did in this bear market from 2000 to 2003, we can trade. Market sells off, we buy more. Market rallies up in a bear market, you sell some or you hedge. And I'm gonna show you some of the tools because pe people have asked in, should I, should I sell out and go to cash? You could, absolutely. But what if it's, this is the bottom and it keeps going higher? Right? Those are the questions you got to ask yourself. And the guy who's trying to educate Canadians and, and, and teach you guys a little bit about some of my experiences, some of the mistakes that I've made over the years, things I've learned in making those mistakes, 
This is what I'm telling you. The best thing to do is be invested, but learn how to invest better and smarter. So if this is the biggest bear market in history in terms of the economy, which it is, I think it's going to unfold like this. I think we're going to see waves and waves and waves of lower. But look at some of these. You saw two, three months of rip-roaring rallies like we've had now, only to be followed months later of lower lows. If you don't think this is going to happen in the worst economy ever, again, we have a different view of the world, at least until there's a vaccine. And there's no guarantee of a vaccine. HIV been around 30 plus years, there's no vaccine. They have viral cures and we don't worry about it anymore, but, but there's no vaccine. Until there's a vaccine, confidence is not going to come back. I'm not going to get on an airplane unless I, if someone holds a gun to my head. Unless it's urgent and, and it's life-threatening, I'm just not going to do it, right? Like, why? Just it, it doesn't make sense until I know I'm protected. So if I have immunity because I've already had it, great, but I'm not going to go seek it. I'm not going to go look to get COVID so I can have immunity. That's crazy. Because what if I have one of these odd things, you know, that, that uh, attacks and, and kills people that are under 60? You know, I'll be 55 in a couple months. <laughs> I, it, the risk factors aren't zero. Anyways, a lot of people are dismissing it. They call it the seasonal flu. That, that, that thought to me makes me sick to my stomach, actually. But anyways, okay, let me move on here. I want to get to some of the questions, and I want to talk about some of the things we should do in portfolios. So when the risk factors are high, look for, for strategies that, that do different things. One of my favorite ones, and I use this in the funds, don't own it today, BTAL and QBTL, market neutral strategy. It's long 200 low beta stocks, short 200 high beta stocks. So it gives you a negative beta. It's not an inverse portfolio, it's market neutral, but it's longer stocks that are less economically sensitive and short of stocks that are higher risk, crappier balance sheets. It, it looks at the top 2,000 stocks in the U.S. It sorts them every three months. It takes the top 200, shorts the bottom 200, and it's market neutral. And look at what it does. For the last decade that it's been out, it's been a terrible holding. But that's been in a bull market. But when the equity markets go bad, like you've seen at a few points over the last decade, it, it does well. So there are things you can own that are better than sitting in cash. So again, going to cash is fine, except it doesn't keep up with inflation. And boy, there's going to be some inflation coming down the road. So if you need a coupon to live off of and don't want to dig into your capital, you need to see capital gains and dividends. You don't have a choice because the world of fixed income, that 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of your portfolio that was traditionally in bonds is done. It's that that game is over. It's not coming back. Interest rates are going to stay low for decades just to keep the economy ticking a little bit. Okay. Here's another great yielding play. So so ZPW was an ETF that I asked BMO to create a number of years ago that writes puts on great companies. And listen, it, the strategy didn't work out. Everything Larry asked for and thinks is going to happen doesn't. Okay, make let's be clear on that. Okay. Um, and so what I said to BMO after a couple of years, I said, listen, I, I haven't liked the performance. It's it's not doing what I hoped and expected it would do. Why don't you do what purpose is doing, but do it better? I want you to create a put right strategy, combine it with a covered call strategy, and BMO's the best and leader in the world on those, by the way, and put them together and generate five, six percent yield and less volatility. And that's what they did. And so you can see what PYF has done over a number of years. It's just it's generating about four or 5% a year, you know, like clockwork, pretty, pretty straight. When the markets are volatile, it doesn't go down much. But it did go down here, just like ZPAY did, but way less than the market. You know, VTI, the Vanguard Total World, that's the yellow there, compared to the BMO US high dividend covered call. That's the ZWH that I like. So again, you got to learn the tools. You got to know what to, to to use in different market environments. It's 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 very very essential. Here's a great one that I like. This is this is another market neutral strategy called alternative 
type of investing. It does better than cash. It's done been doing better than cash for the last year. It, it, it's the portfolio manager says, I like Royal Bank, but I don't like TD. And they go long Royal and short TD. And he says, I like Suncor, but I don't like you know, Crescent Point. And he goes long Suncor and short Crescent Point. And they do that with 50 different things. So they're long 50 things and they're short 50 things, they're market neutral. And if that portfolio manager is any good at doing that, they can generate returns in any kind of market up, down or sideways. And those are the kind of things you want in your portfolio and they can do better than cash. I like these innovator ETFs. Um, company in Canada just came out with uh, similar versions to this. These are where they use option strategies to give you a bit of a buffer. And what I encourage people to do is go to the website, study up on how these, how to use these things because there's very, very different protections. But, but really what, what you should do and could do is learn how to use option strategies. And I'm gonna teach you a little bit about what I do and, and what we just added to the three BMO funds, including ZZZD, okay? So this is a snapshot uh, taken probably about midday today, where in the S&P 500, it might've been before the open, was at 279.10, okay? And so if I wanted to collar my portfolio, I would buy a put and write a call. And so to do that out to the end of the year and, and buying a put and writing a call is no different than shorting the stock, shorting the ETF. And the difference being is you don't own the, the you don't owe the dividend. So typically the difference between the at the money put and call is about the equivalent of the dividend. So you can see here, if I bought a 279 put to protect the market risk in my portfolio, I can go out and buy all the dividend seeking stocks I like and earn those dividends, but hedge or protect the market risk. Now I'm not gonna get a lot of upside. In fact, I may not get any upside because I'm, I've sold that away. So I bought a put at $31.37 to the end of the year. To pay for that, I've written a call. So it's costing me the amount of the dividend but now I can load up on a bunch of these ETFs that give me four, five, six, seven, eight percent yield. And I can hedge my market risk. And how awesome is that? And if we do get a sell off, you sell the put for a higher price because it's going to go up when the market goes down. And your call is going to go down when the market goes down. And you just buy those back. So you sell your put, you buy your call back, you take your hedge off. And now you let your great yielding stocks bounce as the markets bounce. That is what I'm now going to be able to do in addition in the sleep at night portfolios that I couldn't do before April. And I've asked for very special permission. Now I've been doing this in our custom portfolios for clients for years. So um, there, there's a reason our, our, our growth portfolio is down 1% this year. It's because I've hedged a lot of the market risk using strategies like this, okay? All right, uh, so a little bit on my shopping list here going forward. So given the government a largesse and blank check policy and liquidity, uh, gold and bond duration are, are the ways to play it. And you can do it with gold equities, and, and this, it's not as attractive as it was when I started talking about this years ago, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, but there's still lots of, of runway here to the upside for gold. Again, I mentioned uh, uh, Bank of America calling for 3,000 gold in the next year and a half. I don't know where it's going to go, but the answer is higher and you, you got to have some exposure. Um, emerging markets. I love all kinds of emerging markets. I'm, I'm less really bullish on China. I think there's some issues there. The US just sent a uh, uh, our armada of warships into the South China Sea that hasn't got a lot of headline, but as a geopolitical guy, I pay attention to a lot of this. And, and I believe this war on Ch with China, whether it's the Democrats or, or the Republicans, doesn't matter. They're mad at China. In fact, the world is mad at China. So I think what we're gonna see come out of this is, is China is going to lead the East 
and uh, the U.S. is going to lead the developed world in the West, and we're going to separate. We're going to see more separation. So there's parts of emerging markets that I do like, and they're typically uh, parts with very young populations and potential for big growth. India comes to mind. Frontier markets, FM comes to mind. Parts of Africa, ex-South Africa, Nigeria. Uh, have a look at some of those ETFs. In Southeast Asia, I like Thailand, I like Vietnam. Or if you just don't want to get into the individual countries, you can just buy the broader baskets. There's much, much better value in emerging markets uh, today than there still is in, in the U.S. markets. And Europe is an absolute mess. I, I'm underweight Europe. I don't like it other than a handful of the best dividend payers that come out of Europe. And I've talked about ZWE and ZWP as my favorite way to play Europe these days. As 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 debt levels kill growth and we're looking at a world of 1% to 2% growth, I think these ETFs that do puts and calls and generate big yield. They're not bond replacements, guys. It is equity market risk with less volatility, but those might be appropriate for some people. ZPay is some of my biggest holdings right now. But if we see the market go down to some of those much lower levels I talked about, I'm not going to be owning ZPay at that time. I'm going to be replacing it with things I can get a lot of growth out of. And so what do I like coming out of this? I like cybersecurity, I like internet of things, I like 5G, I like robotics, I like clean energy, you name it. Technology is, is going to lead us for the next couple of decades. Healthcare, genomics, there's lots of different ways to play. K-Web is a Chinese internet play. So lots of great ways to play, but ultimately the coming inflation, you don't want to do this trade today, but you want to look at inflation index bonds. When they launch a big infrastructure bill, one of the best ways to play it, again, from much lower levels, are with base metal commodities. So you get steel, uh, BMO has the ZMT, which is an equal weight base metal play in the world, copper, uh, those kind of things. But until all that plays out, hedge the pops and cover on the drops. Let's get into the uh, oh, a little bit on the outlook. I, I, I covered some of these points. I want to get to your questions here. But the biggest thing for me, I, I, I'm, you know, having come from a very, very modest background, and in fact, I would say born into poverty and, and lifted myself up well through education and hard work. Uh, but inequality is the biggest, biggest problem in the world today, bar none. And it's it's far bigger problem than the environment. The environment's important. And I'm a huge advocate of, of a green uh, world. Um, but labor share of, of the economy, labor share of income is, is low and weak and it, it, it never recovered. And it hasn't recovered under, under the Trump administration either despite how, how he bangs his chest on everything's wonderful. This is the biggest problem. And one of the solutions coming out of this Again, the political shift to the left and what we saw coming out of the Great Depression and World War II is stronger unionization, more power for employees and, and, and rising wages. And that is going to be detrimental to earnings multiples and corporate earnings. And it's coming. And higher taxes are going to hurt consumer spending. And we need higher taxes. I don't want them. I think it's a failed policy when you have to juice up taxes to pay for things. That's bad governance. We, we've been governed terribly on the fiscal purse in the US and Canada, every, basically everywhere in the world. The largesse makes me ill because as a CFO of a company, you can't do that stuff. And if you do, you, you, don't, you, go, you deserve to go bankrupt. So, so to me, the world's bankrupt. And inequality is a massive, massive issue. And coming out of this, there's going to be more emphasis on, on a cleaner world and a better environment, which is going to be very expensive and higher taxes and lower multiples. So, so that's equal stagflation. And we're in for decades, I think, and I fear, a very stagnant global growth, and, and, and there, therefore the multiple has to go down. I know it's depressing, guys. Okay, let me get to some of the questions that were written in. People take the time to write in the questions. I'll get to as many as possible. I've answered a lot of them in the pre-conference. And if I have time at the end, I'll get to some more of them. Do you share the view of the growing chorus uh, of uh, 
anti-capitalists who use in the view zero-sum fallacy, blaming buybacks. Okay, so I, I'm I'm in that camp. So this is Ryan. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and when when the questions come in, I I don't shy away from questions. This is a tough question. Or do I agree with Warren Buffett, himself a Democrat, that buying back? I I have no problem with buybacks. I have a problem with buybacks when the sole purpose of the buyback is to enrich the C-suite through growing the share price and issuing themselves stock options and increasing their capital stack. That I have a problem with. And any companies like the airlines, like let them go bankrupt. The airplanes will be there. The jobs will be there. They'll clean house and they'll start up again. And it'll hurt the people who believed in that management. And they should be hurt because they were not good corporate citizens. Now, I have no problem. If the, if a company earns money and says, listen, there's, there's no business opportunity for us to grow, for us to do R&D because we don't like the outlook. That's not a reason like IBM to spend $140 billion buying back your own stock and today have the entire capital stack of IBM to be worth $130 billion. To me, that's egregious. And so, Ryan, I'm going to take up this debate with you and, more, and, and others. But I'm okay with it if there's no other way to give back the money. So you, you don't want to pay out more than 50% in dividends. Like you don't, right? So that should be about the limit, unless you're a REIT or something and you got to, for tax reasons, pay it all out. So so the Canadian banks target about 50% and they give it and they're great dividends. So I would be much more in favor of boosting dividends. I would. Give, especially where bonds are today and people need that yield. So again, Ryan, great question. I'm, I'm a fighter here and I, I'm going to debate uh, on this topic. And uh, I don't expect to change your mind, Ryan, but uh, I'll, I'll debate you on that. And I'll debate anybody who wants to uh, take that on. Uh, with high frequency trading, dark pools, blah, 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 trading systems. Uh, okay, so, so you know, um, have investors been forced into shorter time frames? So um, I think it's Luther here. It looks like it, it got cut off here. Um, so the answer to me here is that you need to do what you need to do. If you're a day trader on the screen, yeah, you're you're competing with computers and don't bother. Okay, my my humble opinion. But if you've got a plan and a strategy on on you know value buy value here, covered call here, who cares what the computers are doing? Who cares? I I don't care. But as it as it increased turnover, as 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 there's no market makers anymore, right? It's liquidity providers. So understand the system. And don't don't try to fight it or compete with it. Okay, have your plan. Buy the stocks you own, but use the ETFs. Do your asset allocation. You know, when risk factors are high, take less risk. When markets sell off, get more aggressive. Pretty simple. Don't worry about the computers. Andy asked, uh, you and many analysts keep saying that there's trouble ahead, yet the markets keep going up in a V-shaped recovery. Why is that? Andy, I showed you that chart of the bear market from 2000 to 2003. It happened, it's happened before, it'll happen again. We'll get a sell-off, maybe we'll make a lower low, maybe we won't, I don't know, okay? But to think there's gonna be a V-shaped recovery with the worst economic, so, so if you don't understand the shock here and what it means for the economy and what the ripple effects are going to be for, for social policy, uh, what the, what all the debt means, that higher taxes are going to be necessary. If you think we're going back to the world of free money and, and you know, dancing in the streets, you don't understand what the roaring 20s were all about in the Great Depression. And I'm not saying we're going into a Great Depression, but I wouldn't be surprised 20 or 30 years from now that this wasn't the great stagflation era, okay? But having said all that, with interest rates at zero, what is the retiree going to do? What are you going to do to meet your 30 years of not having income in your portfolio or safe income? The answer is, Andy, learn how to invest. Learn asset allocation. 
And ETFs are the simplest, most elegant solution. And they're so cheap, okay? And I love them. And I called my company ETF Capital Management largely because of that. Gold stocks have doubled since March 23. Is there still more upside? Okay, don't look at the March 23 low. Draw a trend line for the last couple of years because what happened in March was a deleveraging of, of, of funds that use gold as an asset class. It was forced, unwind, it wasn't real. To me, that was a shock and noise. In fact, I bought more into that dip. Understand that gold has a phenomenal runway here because of what gold means to the world from a flight to safety, from a deflation standpoint, and from an inflation standpoint, and think about what the next few years is going to mean for the world. And in that environment, how much gold do you want in your portfolio? The answer is not 100%. In my portfolios, 10 to 25%, depending on the mandate. Okay? Very important, Dominic. Christine asks, uh, she's retired, have a fairly low risk tolerance, uh, putting some cash into QBTL. Obviously, she's seen previous webinars. Love your thoughts on this. Do I need to be concerned about the recent strategy modification? So uh, every quarter, QBTL rebalances, and it next rebalances in May. So to me, think about QBTL every quarter as an orange. And as the markets move around, a lot of the benefit of being long, low volatility and short, high volatility gets squeezed out a little bit. So I'm not going to get back into it till the rebalance if I use it at all again. Um, so if the environment's right, I'll, I'll step back into it. But I don't think the mar this market's going to get high enough uh, where I would want to put that trade on at the moment. Um, but it, it could go up two or three or four percent, perhaps, from where it is today, if we see a return back to the lows. So go look at it, look at where it was at the lows, and kind of judge for yourself, Christine, if that works for you. That would be the best advice I can give. Roland asks, can I spend a bit more time um, as it relates to the two sets of options I talked about? And okay, so so what I have on in the, in the uh, portfolio right now is a calendar uh, and price spread. So I didn't collar it like I explained there, where I did it right at the money. So what I did there because um, you know what what I wanted to do was was play a more uh, shorter term move down, but I also wanted to leave some upside. So I the first tranche we put on was around 250 on the SPY um, in early uh, I think April 3rd was the first date. So I bought uh, the SPY 250 put, and I sold the December 265 call, leaving me some upside potential if the markets rally a little bit more. So at 250, that was the first retracement. 265 was the second, and the third one is around was around 2800, 280. So I've staggered my um, hedges um, around those retracement levels. Uh, and, and to do that at no cost, you have to bring in the calendar spread. You get, you more you go out of the money, but the longer you go, you get more premium. So those trades cost me nothing, Roland, um, but I have a little bit of calendar risk, uh, if you can understand that in the portfolio. Allison is asking, if, if we assume Canadian dollar will go to 60, can you comment on the horizon? So I don't think we'll see it at that level. Um, I, I think maybe 65 is probably as bad as it gets. Um, and so, yeah, DLR is a good way to play that if you want to play in the U.S. dollar and, and stay in a Canadian dollar account. Uh, I'm looking at some individual Canadian stocks, for example, TELUS and Enbridge, wondering if my analysis would indicate um, the price for telecoms and utilities could still go lower. So, so the answer is yes. Um, even the best stocks, the best, best stocks in a bear market, 90% of stocks at the bottom are well below their 200-day averages. So um, yeah, the, all, all stocks will fall if my scenario of lower lows continues to play out into next year. These are not exceptions, but they will most likely go down less than others because of their more defensive properties. 
how would you respond to Michael Burry's recent comments that we are in ETF bubble? Uh, so Michael Burry is the uh, guy that uh, uh, called the last bubble in the big short, and he was the one that was uh, shorting all these uh, credit default swaps and 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 CDOs and 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 made you know bags and bags of money. So he's come out recently and and said ETFs are a problem. So, Michael, I, I need to educate you a little bit. And with all due respect, you're a brilliant guy. <laughs> uh, ETF is a mutual fund. And while it's passive, if you take the ZCN, which is the large cap Canadian BMO ETF, and you take every large cap equity fund in Canada, 75% of every manager in Canada's large cap Canadian equity fund is going to statistically look like the ETF. And if you don't believe that, you got to do the homework yourself. Okay. So whether it's active or passive, it's still basically the index. And I gave you the example before of the weight of those 30 or 20 names and how big that is in, in terms of the US market. Now in the US, there's 500 stocks. You can pick 20, 30, 40 stocks that don't look like the index, <laughs> okay? But in Canada, there's only 60 big stocks. And in a mutual, a large cap mutual fund in Canada, they're all gonna own the same 30 or 40, maybe slightly different weights, i.e. the manager likes Royal Bank a little bit more than he likes another one. But Royal Bank is 6% of the index. So if you like Royal Bank, and you want to be bullish on it, you got to own more than 6%. And back in 2000, Nor the Nortel issue, Nortel became 35% of the TSX. If you hired a manager and they put 35% in one stock, the securities regulators would shoot them. Canada actually has a very bad index. So is there an ETF bubble? I, I would submit there isn't. I would submit there's a lot of money tracking passive indexes because fundamentally all the portfolio managers on the planet collectively, 85% of them in any given year don't beat the market. So why pay big fees if they don't beat the market after charging you those big fees? So ETFs aren't going away, they're gonna get more popular. And I would uh, I would be welcome to uh, to debate Mr. Burry and uh, thank him for a lot of his brilliance on on some other things, but he's wrong on this. Okay, with all the major governments increasing their debt substantially, what's the net effect? So I, I covered this as a global financial breakdown. Possible, we're in it. This is a global financial breakdown. Okay, we're we're here, Frank. This this is a global financial market breakdown. So far the fire hose has been massive and there's no end to it. Now, Mitch McConnell said today, if you caught one of those headlines, uh, we're not bailing out the municipalities. I got news for you, Mitch. <laughs> if we see municipalities start to go under uh, in terms of, of the spread of those bonds, you bet you're coming back to buy those and the Fed will buy them. So. The, the, there's no end to the large S here, um, but again, gold is, 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 is a big beneficiary of this. And uh, the system isn't gonna break down. The world will go on, the sun will come out tomorrow. But the world is, is pretty messed up financially. It argues for decades of stagnation, guys. That's, that's what it argues for, okay? In my view of the world. Collins, my wife's a dual citizen, is prohibited from owning Canadian mutual funds. Is there another? So there, there's a provision in uh, the mutual fund code where they can pay some kind of fee and, and become eligible. I don't know much about it at all. Uh, Colin, uh, I would uh, ask if you have a financial advisor. Uh, if, if you don't and use a discount, I would call their line and ask them. Um, BMO ZZZD, uh, my belief, it's not eligible um, under that rule. Um, uh, the cost of doing that is not inconsequential. Um, 
regulatory fees and filings, et cetera, et cetera, 20 or $30,000 a year, perhaps. So unless there was a reason for them to increase the uh, allocation to American citizens in any fund for that matter, ZZZ or others, by more than $30,000 in fees, you're not gonna see many do it, Colin, unfortunately. But I appreciate the support and thank you. If I use a robo-advisor to manage my million dollar portfolio and they rebalance at the end of each month, plus or five percent, is that sound strategy? So, so don't use a robo-advisor, Jack. Learn how to use ZCON, ZBAL, and ZGRO. And figure out what your neutral target is, Jack, because you're, you're gonna do a, a questionnaire and the questionnaire is gonna throw you into a 60-40 portfolio or something like that. And they're gonna charge you 40, 50, 60, 70 basis points, I don't know. But for 18 basis points in a discount account, you can rebalance for free and, and some of them for trading ETFs. Um, and, uh, and, and do basically what a robo is gonna do for you and do it on your own and save a half a percent a year. So. Jack, I hope that's an idea for you. Now, if you don't have the time or intestinal fortitude to do some of those things, then there's nothing wrong with a robo advisor, okay? You gotta pay for service, whether it's a robo or something else. But I say with a little bit of homework and a little bit of effort, you can do stuff that's that simple. And again, another reason why I love ETFs uh, so much. So unfortunately, there's there's only um, a couple of minutes left and I wanna use those for closing. So apologize for not being able to get to all the questions that have come in. Um, we are doing these weekly. And so please come back next week. And if you want your question answered, um, try to get it in early rather than the online. Uh, again, if you're interested in the BMO funds that we run, whether it's ZZZD or the other portfolios, you can buy them all for the same MERs, low MERs in ZZZD in the discount class at your discount broker. So you can buy the balanced, you can buy our growth portfolio or, or the dividend one. There's more information on how to do that at ZZZD portfolios. If you are interested in us building custom portfolios for you and you have portfolios of a million dollars or more, we would be very happy to talk to you uh, at my company, ETF Capital Management. And if you are interested, Monique's going to do a fantastic webinar next week, which I will be on. I will be introducing Monique and uh, challenging her on, on a couple of questions. Um, but but you potential, folks, it's about you. So So have a financial plan done. It's probably the one most important thing you can do other than learning how to, to use ETFs on your own. Uh, for those of you uh, women out there and some of the men too, Golden Girl Finance gives a little bit of a different perspective to the world of investing uh, from the lens of, of uh, our better halves in, in most case guys. Um, and uh, Q Wealth for any other uh, portfolio managers out there uh, or financial advisors who wanna learn more about how to partner with the, the growth in in, uh, and where we see the world going. And, and finally here, folks, uh, we do these things, that we do them for free, um, we spend a lot of time and effort in, and we ask for your help. And there are a lot of tremendous charities in the world, and I get that, and, 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 uh, but the two that are most dear uh, to my business partner, Jared and I, are uh, leukemia and cancer research at the Sick Kids Hospital here in Toronto. Sick Kids, as, as people in Toronto know, is a world leader. Uh, there's so many things they've developed and learned at Sick Kids is taught at hospitals across Canada and around the world. And many of the top doctors in Canada have been trained through Sick Kids. Baycrest uh, Hospital is a world leader in, in dementia and Alzheimer's research. Uh, they are currently actually working with uh, hospital development in Beijing to create a dementia and Alzheimer's uh, unit at some of the hospitals there. Uh, world leader there. I'm actively involved with Baycrest, an active fundraiser for them. Uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Folks, if you don't have your, your wits about you, uh, you're not you. It's, it's, it's very simple. So I would appreciate your support there. On the uh, feedback email that will go out tomorrow, 
with a replay of this webinar. There will be uh, a couple buttons you can click to make those donations. Please make them there so we can track them and match those donations. Folks, thank you very much for tuning in with us this week. We will see you again next week, and I will be on a special edition of Berman's Call tomorrow at 4.30 on BNN. We'll see you then.